thank you all for that. But today we got a, a special guest with us from Phoenix, Arizona. His name's Christian Chambliss, and I'm going to tell a story real quick that you had no idea I was about to say and what I'm doing, I'm, and uh, it's going to be a bro moment, but um, so whenever we went to school together, actually we didn't go to school together, we kind of went to the same church in Missouri, so I was at Evangel, he was at a leadership college at the church I was attending, and you see what me growing up, uh, me growing up, I, I was always like this right hand to the youth pastor. So like I loved ministry and I, I was that student magnet. And I ain't going to lie, like at 18, 19 years old, you know, I probably had this like ego about me a little bit that was like, hey, I love students. Students love me. It's going to be awesome. And so uh, anyways, I went to James River and uh, it was it was like eye opening for me because I went to a church that was massive, you know, 12,000 people to runs a ton of students. And I saw this guy named Christian Chambliss. And you see, back then we had like life groups and stuff. And I had a life group that had like two people. And he had like a life group that had like 70 kids. You know, and they on Wednesday nights they had like 1,100 uh, kids that would come every Wednesday night to a service. And, bro, there was a part of me, you have no idea about this, but God used you to challenge my ego. Because I would see you and see the students so magnetized to you. And at first I was, I was like a jealous in a way. I was like, man, I need that. I want to get that. I want to get there. But Robert Madu spoke a message one day at James River about staying in your lane. And he said, you need to stop looking at someone right now. You have no idea. But I was sitting in there. I, I got to stop looking at Christian Chambliss. And I need to cheer him on. And I need to become friends with that guy because he's amazing. He's awesome. So you have no idea how much you challenged me to grow. And I'm going to tell you something about this guy. He's amazing. He's a phenomenal communicator. And, uh, and one thing, he can eat. Oh my goodness. He, bro, you've been putting some food down this week. He said, he said, what you, I said, what you want to do when you come down to New Orleans? He goes, dude, I want to eat. I heard they got food there and I want to try some good food. But uh, man, this guy right here, like I say, all our guest speakers, he doesn't just uh, talk to talk, man. He walks the walk, man. He loves the Lord with everything he has. And he, I don't know if I've ever seen somebody with a bigger heart for evangelism, just to, to go bring somebody to Jesus. So with all that said, why don't you guys help me give a a big church on a mission welcome for Christian Chambliss. Come on, my man. Thank you very much. That was a that was a great intro. I've uh, I've been introed in many different ways, but eating has not been a description. Um, thank you. Um, but he's accurate. Uh, there is great food in in New Orleans. How many of you guys love the food here? Oh my goodness. I, I love that there's like a legit clap to that. That's fantastic. Uh, it's super great. That's how you know you're in a good place when I mention food and everybody claps. Uh, I, uh, I, my vacations usually are centered around uh, three things. When I go on a vacation with my wife, we do three things, and it's this uh, I pick cities that are known for good food, good coffee, and churches that I want to attend. And so, um, my wife's not here, but this has been, uh, this has been the, uh, the prime example of that type of trip. I uh, got to eat a lot of food. I ate a, uh, a foot-long po' boy yesterday in a alligator. No, listen, this is amazing. Alligator cheesecake. Like, like are you kidding me? It was, it was amazing. And, uh, and then last night, I ate uh, uh, about four sushi rolls. Um, one of them had 10 pieces, and I was even ashamed of myself after that one, um, but it's really good. I'm so glad, so glad to be here, so honored, and um, I'm really impressed, really amazed with how well done this church is, and uh, I love your pastors. Uh, I want you to understand something. Uh, church planting is probably the single hardest uh, way of doing church here in America, uh, fortunately, we're not persecuted yet, um, but this is almost as hard. <laughs> um, and so your pastors have said thousands and thousands and thousands of small yeses behind the scenes uh, so that you can enjoy this community, that you can enjoy uh, the presence of God on a weekly basis. And their heart is for you, getting to hang out with Ryan the past couple days and talk with him. His heart is genuinely 100% for this community. He's got dreams 10 years plus down the road for what this church could be. And so I, I, always, I always love being able to go to a church because I can, 
I can say things about the pastor he can't say about himself. And, uh, and so I, I applaud you. I think you and Leah are better off the stage than you are on the stage. Um, I think the people that are here serving and following you are privileged to be a part of this church. And so, so church, I would say this. Um, it takes uh, so much guts to, uh, to plant a church and to ask people uh, to move from all over the country and to be a part of it. It takes a lot of courage to do that. And so I always say this, where there is a vision, God will bring the provision. And I believe in this place that God has given uh, Ryan and Leah a vision for Church on a Mission, and you are the provision to that vision. So whatever is in their hearts, I challenge you and I encourage you, whatever is in their hearts, if you are a committed believer in this room, whatever is in their hearts, may it be your heart as well. And you say, Pastor, I'm with you. Whatever you want to do, count me in. I am all in. I would say this, believers in the room, don't be, don't be another cause of correction for Pastor Ryan and Leah. Be the ones that say, I'm going to run just as fast along with you. You don't have to convince me. I'm with you. Are you with me? And together, let's reach a city. So um, my, um, what I'm going to do today is this. I'm going to talk about, uh, like he said, evangelism is my heart. And I'm going to talk about that exact thing this morning. My, uh, I do, I, my wife and I, we started a ministry in Arizona called Youth Alive. And what we do is our, 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 our whole goal is to work with churches to reach local schools. So in Arizona, uh, we work with uh, youth pastors and, uh, and students to start what we call a life-giving campus club in a, in, a, in a high school and a middle school. And as well, what we do is we work with churches uh, to put on free school assemblies for the school. So the school doesn't have to pay for it. And we come in and we do a completely secular character-building talk around the ideas of suicide, drug abuse, depression, uh, social media. And then we challenge students to take ownership and be leaders on their campus. And then we pair that up with an outreach in the evening where we preach the gospel and because in the evening we rent the facility and it's, it's awesome. And we've seen um, just this last semester, just this last semester, we've seen 117 students come to know Jesus right on campus. I'll tell you something, it's really cool to see people come to Jesus in church and I'll never get tired of that, but there's nothing quite like a room, like a high school uh, in a gym in a high school, seeing a student say yes to Jesus. It's, it's remarkable. Uh, but what I want to do is before I get started, I want to introduce you to my family. Uh, do you have the picture? Uh, uh, it's still it's a little, it's a little um, dark, but that's okay. That's my wife, Brittany. Uh, she, my name is Christian. She is a Christian. She keeps me sane, and she makes me an adult. And that's my little boy. His name is Oliver. He has a big head. And, um, I mean, I just couldn't love him. I couldn't love him anymore. He looks just like me, and man, he's got his mom's nose. Um, I don't know when he's gonna. I don't know when he's gonna give that back to her. But um, <laughs> the dumb joke. Uh, Ryan, it doesn't take long for the dad jokes to start. So, how how are you excited for the Keller baby? Are, are you are you serious right now? Oh man, the Keller baby. Um, really quick, can I, get, I forgot to grab a bottle of water. Um, oh my goodness, what a servant, what a legend. Thank you very, 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 very much. So that's my wife. Uh, she um, is in Nebraska right now with her family. I wish she was here with us. Um, and uh, my little boy has hand, foot, and mouth right now. So it's really sad. So if you've ever had a baby um, and you know what that is, um, just Say a quick um, prayer over my wife because she is handling him alone right now and has to fly tomorrow morning. I don't wish that on my worst enemies. Um, even if he's not sick, flying with a toddler is miserable. Anybody, anybody experienced that before? Oh, yeah, just me. Cool. Fantastic. Well, um, my friends, I'm an interactive speaker. I'm an interactive preacher. I like to, um, I love a good amen here and there. And um, I, 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 I cannot pa uh, preach without passion. I can't speak without enthusiasm. Uh, a verse, a scripture that I, I want to leave behind me everywhere I go is this. Proverbs uh, 13.22 says that a, a, a joyful heart is good medicine, um, and a, a crushed spirit dries up bones. And so my prayer in my heart would be anywhere that I go, that I would be 
uh, a good medicine because of my joy that is, that is exuding through me. And so uh, I can't speak without passion. That's just a part of me. And so um, I believe that church should not just be a monologue, but it's a dialogue. So um, if God is speaking to you, um, it is encouraging for me to know. So if I say something that's good, just give me a nice amen or that's good. Um, or maybe you could stop the person next to you. It's like, that was for you. Listen. Um, or uh, maybe you can give me a, a one of my, when I was a youth pastor, we had this kid named Gavin. And uh, I would always, he was, he was silent, always silent. But I would always know I'm doing a good job uh, by when I would look at him. If the room was quiet, I'm like, dang it, I'm doing a bad job. Then I would look at Gavin. And there was this face he was making. I would always know if I'm doing good. And it was this right here. It was this. It was a stink face. So maybe you're not an extrovert. You're not likely to be loud. You can just give me a nice stink face, and I will, I'll know that I'm doing okay. Sound good? Yeah. Cool. Well, this morning, I want to speak to you around the idea of evangelism. My message title today is The Strategy of Evangelism. Oh, hey, that's fantastic. Um, I didn't know that was going to be there. Uh, Tori, you're on top of things. Let's go. You made that really quick. I gave her the, my sermon notes last night at like 11.30, and so that was, that was good. Um, but I want to talk about evangel- evangelism. I think this, I think evangelism is God's heart, God's rescue mission for the world. And what I love so much about Jesus is that he wants us to be a part of, of what he is doing. You know, here's the thing. He doesn't need us, right? He doesn't need us, but he wants us, and he chooses us, and he wants to work through us. So what is exactly, what exactly is evangelism? Evangelism is this. It is, it is the spreading of the gospel in one of two ways. One, preaching in a setting like this, someone on the mic telling about the good news, which the gospel literally means good news. How many of you know it's good news that Jesus died on the cross and we get to go to heaven and not hell? How many of you know that's good news? How many of you know it's good news that heaven is not just fire insurance, but Jesus makes it possible to live a life right here and now that I could never have lived before? How many of you know that's good news? Come on, somebody. So it's preaching, and the other was this, personal advocacy, personal witness, personal story. I want to challenge you with this question this morning. Which do you think is the most effective? Which do you think has the furthest reach? Even though we have social media right now, and this message could be on the other side of the world instantaneously, I would argue the most effective form of evangelism is not one singular person on the microphone, but a unified body spreading the gospel through personal advocacy. And I want to challenge you with this thought. It is not the pastor's job to do the work of the ministry. Wait, what? It's the, that's, his full, that's his gig. Guess what he does? No, the, 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 the job of the pastor is not to do the work of the ministry. The job of the pastor is to equip and train the saints to do the work of the ministry. So in other words, the goal of being here on a weekly basis is to come, receive a word from Jesus, be equipped, be filled up, and then be sent out. The church is a unified body. We should be the most zealous advocates of the cause we are a part of. What is the cause that we are a part of? That Jesus came and he died for our sins. And there is a world that needs to know about his love. So it is not Ryan's job to reach people. It is your job to come be a part of this community, come be a part of this body, and take the message of Jesus everywhere you go. So what I want to do this morning is um, I want to read a scripture out of uh, Matthew 28, 16 through 20. This is God's, this is God's uh, call and command and commission for us believers. What I want you to know as well, um, a lot of the times I work with students a lot and they think that evangelism or spreading, their, spreading the gospel is simply just inviting people to church. Now, let me just throw this out there. That's great. 
That's fantastic. I, I, I'm, I'm always going to be a, an advocate for inviting people to church. But I want you to know something. Um, inviting people to church isn't sharing your faith. Uh, I didn't get saved at a church. I got saved in the passenger seat of a Jeep uh, through a student who was sharing Jesus with me on a regular basis. So if, if it's all about inviting people to church, what are we going to do about the people who will never step foot in these doors? Evangelism is a dialogue, not a monologue. Evangelism flows out of relationship. In relationship takes time. And we'll get to that here in a minute. But let me read you this scripture. Matthew 28, 16 through 20. I'm reading the ESV. And if you don't have it, it's going to be up here on the Sky Bible. And it says this. The 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When Jesus saw, or when, sorry, when, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray. Father, I pray right now, Lord Jesus, that uh, you would speak to our lives, speak to our hearts. I pray for anybody that is in the room who is currently in a place of renting their faith. I pray that by the end of this day, they would be owners of their faith. And Lord, I pray that in the name of Jesus, this would spark a movement in expansion of the gospel even as quick as tomorrow, I pray for conversations to develop. Thank you for using me. We love you. We ask this in your name. We pray. Amen. Amen. I'll drink to that. <laughs> that's good. That's, that's some good water. It's really crisp. Hallelujah. You Louisians know how to do water. <laughs> <laughs> so the scripture, let me give some context for it. This is what's known as the Great Commission. If you've been in church for more than a day, you've probably read or heard this scripture. So this is after Jesus died on the cross uh, and rose from the dead, and before he ascends to heaven, he has this one final meeting with his disciples. And he says, listen, because I have overcome the grave, now it is, our, it, it is now your job to enact my rescue mission for the world. Now go tell everybody about me. So I want to ask you this. What would you think, what would you say is the key word of that entire Scripture, that entire passage, what would you say is the key word? Some would say maybe it is, it's going. The key word of evangelism, the key word of our cause, our mission is to go. Yeah, we're going to go, we're going to send missionaries all over the world. Yeah, we're going to go into our workplace. Yeah, we're going to go plant the church. Maybe it's go. Some would say it's, it's nations, it's nations. we got to reach the nations. Or uh, others would say it's disciples. Yeah, I think discipleship is fantastic. We need to make disciples. That's what we're called to do. It's, it's wonderful. Maybe it's disciples. I would argue this. I think every single sentence, every syllable, and every word is built around this one key word, and that is this, them. The key word of the great commission from Jesus Christ himself. The key word of our call, our most foundational, fundamental call as believers is them. Everything Jesus says, it hinges upon and is built around them. Go to who? Them. Make disciples of who? Them. Baptize who? Them. Our call, our goal is to reach them. So who is them? Who would, them would be anybody who is outside of the body of Christ. In other words, them would be anybody who has not yet made a decision to put their faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, the, them is anybody who is a non-believer. As scripture would refer to it as this, them is those who, who are spiritually lost. Them is whoever is spiritually lost. Have you ever heard the phrase, reach the lost? And people are like, they're not lost, they have a GPS. You know what I mean? Like, why are we talking about people that are lost? I think sometimes, uh, I I, want to throw this out there, I think sometimes Christians can make ourselves seem a little um, 
arrogant and judgmental by the way we refer to people as lost. But I think, I think when we understand that people without Jesus are spiritually lost. They don't, they don't have a set destination of heaven. They are spiritually lost. They haven't found themselves. They haven't found the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. They are spiritually lost. And our job is to reach the lost. How many of you know Jesus' heart is for lost people? Are you with me? Jesus' heart is for lost people. Let me tell you something. I, I think I can say this with certainty on this. If you come here and you're a believer and you say, I want you to cater to me. I want you to meet my needs I would say you are in the wrong church. Why? Because this is church on a mission. What is the mission? To reach Kenner, to reach Metairie, to reach greater New Orleans with the love of Jesus. This is a mission, uh, this is a church with a lost-centered mission, a lost centered focus. This is not a church that says, hey, we're going to play Christian patty cake and hold each other's hands and sing some good songs. That is a country club, not a church. Our job is to reach lost people. My youth ministry, when I was, when I was a pastor, we were 80, 90 percent unchurched. 80, 90 percent. I was telling Pastor Ryan some of the students that were in my youth ministry. I had kids that were coke dealers. I had a kid who literally confessed murder to me, was gang banging. I had some really headache people in my youth ministry. But I believe that is what Jesus wants in these doors because his heart is for the lost. You ever felt like, oh man, pastor doesn't care about me. Yes, he does care about you. But I would say this, if pastor doesn't uh, come to your every beck and whim, I would say this, it's because, um, have you ever uh, lost something? You're running around in your, in your couch looking for your keys. Uh, you already got your microwave. You're not worried about finding your microwave. You know where that is. You need to get somewhere, so you're looking everywhere for your keys. You're, turn, you're throwing up everything. You're flipping up your, your lampshades, everything, to find your lost keys. You don't care about what you found because it's found. You have it right here. Are you with me? The church isn't about the found. It's about the lost. So the lost is God's heart. We are a part of God's rescue mission. Sweet home Alabama. It's good. You know what? I'll drink to that. That's good. Hallelujah. Scripturally speaking, I want to give you three thoughts. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you three scriptural structures in order to reach the lost, and then I will give you three practical, um, um, strategic thoughts when it comes to reaching non-believers. So here's what I'd say. In order to reach the lost, we must understand the lost, we must love the lost, and we must know the lost. Here, I, 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 This just aggravates me to no end. When Christians do this, that's bad. That's ugly. That's wrong. I can't believe they would do that. Blah, 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 blah. No, no, no. We are not, as Christians, we're not supposed to point our finger at things that are away from Jesus. We are supposed to step into dark rooms and turn the lights on. Are you with me? I get so irritated at Christians for being mad at non-Christians for acting like non-Christians. Are you with me on that? Can you, can you think about how stupid that is for a Christian to be like, I'm so mad at you for blah, for you cussed today. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I really do honestly think if Jesus was here today, I had a conversation about this just the other day. I literally think if Jesus was here, he would frustrate the heck out of all of us. Why? Because he would go places and talk to people and do things that would really make us question but I think that in order to reach people no one else is reaching, you have to go where no one else is going. Are you with me? So in order to reach the lost, we must understand the lost, love the lost, and know the lost. Hebrews 2.18 says this, For because he, meaning Jesus himself, has suffered when tempted, he was able to help those who are being tempted. In other words, Jesus says, listen, 
I've gone through what they've gone through. I understand where they are. It's not our job to point the finger. It's not our job to say, you're so wrong. It's not effective for believers to be known for what they are against. We are effective when, we know, when we're known for what we are for. We are for people. Are you with me? Let us seek to understand people. The most frustrating thing in the entire world, you see this especially in politics, no one seeks to understand anybody. Are you with me? Let Christians be the outliers. Let's understand people as well. Luke 19.10 9, says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Here's what I love about Jesus. His heartbeat was to constantly pursue and love the lost. When I, when I met my wife, uh, her, uh, uh, she was not into me at all. At all. My job was to seek her out. So my love for her, I, I fell in love with her instantly. Uh, my, uh, her, my first Sunday at our church was her second Sunday. And I saw her and I was like, mm, dang girl. And um, I thought she was so beautiful, so much so that I didn't talk to her for a whole month because I was too scared. But then I realized... I don't even know her name. And I'm like, there's something about her. I need to know her. And the more I got to know her, the more I began to love her. And I would begin to seek her, pursue her. And listen, I began to pursue her, and she turned me down, no lie, three times. I asked her out one night, and she's like, nah. And then I asked her another time, nah. I asked her out a third time. People think third time's a charm. Mm -mm. I was like, please? And she said, no. And listen, I think sometimes people will push you away to see how many times you'll keep coming back. We must continue to seek and pursue. And finally, the fourth time, I went out to her, I went to her apartment. I asked her to come downstairs and talk to me. And I proceeded to literally, like, beg her, <laughs> like, please date me. And she, I th- I've, been, I've been getting to win her over little by little. And so she said, yes. And my literal next response was this. I love you. <laughs> and she goes, okay. And then we got married like nine months later or whatever, however long it was. That's a silly thing to say, but I believe this. I believe after, after seeking and pursuing lost people, turning us away and saying no, our, our, this is Jesus' response when one finally says yes, can't contain himself like I couldn't contain my love for my wife. As soon as she said yes, I was overjoyed and I couldn't contain my word vomit. And I believe that when someone comes home, someone comes into the body of Christ, Jesus can't contain himself. He can't help himself. And that is our heart as believers that when someone comes home, we can't contain ourselves. Are you with me this morning, church? Let me get an amen. Come on. And finally, we must seek to know the lost. 1 Corinthians 9, 22, verse 23 says, To the weak I became the weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it for the sake of the gospel. I do it for the sake of the good news that I might share with them in its blessing. I want to know people who are hurting. You know, you know what I mean? I got to meet this girl. Her name was Guadalupe. We did a school assembly. When, I, when I'm talking about like getting in with the weak, getting in with the downtrodden, getting down with the, in with the, the ones who are hurting, there's a girl named Guadalupe. We did a school assembly and... Um, at the evening event, we shared the gospel. It was amazing. And uh, this girl named Guadalupe came forward. And one of my staff prayed for her. And um, she's, this girl, Brandy, my staff, she was like, she didn't open up. But I just feel like something is there still. So they, she went and talked to her and still didn't open up. And I was like, did she say anything? She's like, no. She just, I, I feel like God wanted me to talk to her. So I did. And um, about an hour later, as we're packing up and leaving, uh, Brandy gets a text from Guadalupe. She gave her number, and uh, she uh, and Brandy screenshots the text and sends it to me. And it was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. Heart wrenching, but it's beautiful. This is what she said. She said the reason why I didn't open up is because I've been so ashamed. See, Guadalupe has had three men in her family: her dad, stepdad, 
and brother, all three sexually assault her. And then her brother committed suicide. And so here she was thinking she deserved everything she, she experienced. And then she thought it was her fault. Her brother killed himself. And so she's sitting there thinking to herself, I don't have any reason to be here. Maybe suicide is the answer for me too. But then she told Brandy, she says, but tonight, because you came here tonight, I feel like there really is hope. And that night, Guadalupe gave her heart to Jesus Christ, and God saved her. So listen, when we know the loss, here's the thing. Um, I'm very passionate about numbers, and not because I, I'm, I'm a statistical person. I don't like math. But I think this, numbers represent people. People represent souls, and souls represent different stories. Everyone's story is coming together to weave the beautiful tapestry that is the gospel, that Jesus saves everyone from all walks of life. You've never done too much to, to be out of his acceptance. You've never gone too far to be out of his love. You can't do anything to make him love you any less. We must seek to know lost people. Are you with me? So in the time that I have left, I, I hope I'm not going too long. Um, um, could I get, have someone help me like, get these? Uh, I want to walk you through three strategic pieces. Um, this one right, right here, the third, third, and this one's the first one. That one's middle. Can, can everybody see that? Let's move this one over here so you can see it a little better. So we're all, all together here. So what I want to do is this. I want to walk you through the strategy that I believe this is effective when it comes to reaching the lost. Now, you know, we must understand, love, and know lost people. But how do we strategically bring them? And so, yes, when it comes to mission, we need strategy. You know what I mean? Because how are we going to know we're reaching our strategy? Are you with me? Or how are we going to know if we're reaching our mission? Are you with me? Yeah. So I want to give you some strategy when it comes to God's heart and God's rescue mission. Number one would be this. We want to take people through three different chairs in life. Three different chairs. Um, why is it a chair? Because we're always sitting. You know what I mean? Um, life's all about chairs. Uh, at least for dads. When your kids are born, you're sitting in a chair. You're like, I can't believe this is happening. I'm, oh, my gosh, I'm a dad now. Um, maybe that was just me. I don't know. Um, sorry about that. That was weird. But um, number one would be this. We want to take people through the chair of conversation. Conversation. And this, here's what this looks like. As a believer, you have a voice. I don't care if you're the most socially awkward, most introverted person in the entire world. You have the voice, the voice and the ability to connect with at least one person at a time. And so we, we challenge people in Arizona, we challenge students with this. Have conversations with people. Sit down around a table. Sit down in the Starbucks. Learn and take chances. Have conversations with people. Here is the truth. I want you to understand something is this. We live in a deconstruction society, right? Deconstructionist society. Everybody wants to deconstruct everything and make sure it is real before they buy into anything. There is a... Um, there is an initial lack of trust of institution here in America. Are you, are you tracking with me? Do you see that? Like, any, any time it comes to a big organization or a corporation, uh, there's lack of trust, especially in Phoenix. People don't really like big box stores, right? There's a, there's a, a, a distaste towards big, right? And so what do we want to do? We want to help people see realness. We want to help people see truth so we have one-on-one -on -one conversation. A lot of the times, the things that are said from the stage can be misconstrued, can be uh, misunderstood. So the believers then have one-on-one -on -one conversations. Are you with me? Yeah. I want to be the type of leader that doesn't just talk about lost people. I don't want to be the person who talks to lost people. Are you with me? Yeah. It needs to start with conversation, one-on-one -on -one conversation, building trust with people. Why? Because ministry flows out of relationship, and relationships take time. I said this earlier. I'll say it again. Uh, evangelism is not a dialogue. It's a monologue, right? Sorry, it's not a monologue. It's a dialogue. Thank you. Conversation. And conversation leads to the middle ground of community. As in Arizona, here's how this looks for us. Our ministry context is this. We do life-giving campus clubs, right? We want to help students have conversations with their friends. 
plant a life-giving campus club in their school. And our campus clubs are this, this is what our idea of campus club is. Our goal is this, students who will not come to church, maybe we could create a middle ground for them between the church and the school, which is a campus club right in their context. And we want to get students who have no relationship, no understanding with Jesus, to converse with students who do know Jesus, get them into a healthy, life-giving community. And what we want to see is first-time salvation and connection then to a local church. Here's what this looks like for you. Conversation with people, getting them into a life group. I know this church has life groups. And I think life groups are so valuable, are so important. Why? Because it takes ministry into a personal context. Discipleship does not have happen in rows. It happens in circles. We need to create community. I think this, when I was a youth pastor, this is the exact, the, the exact strategy we had. Uh, we had a service once a month, and we would have, uh, 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 every week we would have community groups. Every single week. And our community groups were at homes. They were larger than our services. Because I think this, most people don't care about the big corporate if they don't have relationship and they don't have Community, are you with me? So many people are doing life alone. What if we legitimately converse with people, get them into a community? I have no problem with this, and I, I'm sure Pastor Ryan has no problem with someone not coming to church for a while if they're in the community of your life group. I had no problem with that. Why? Because they're still hearing the message of Jesus. They're being around a, a healthy community of believers, right? Right? Life groups could be and should be, I think, a middle ground between people who have no relationship with Jesus and who are still yet to come to church. Your life group could be that. So if you're not leading a life group, you need to. If you're not attending a life group, you need to. Let me say this. Don't rent this church. Own this church. Are you with me? Don't rent. Own. Remember it. It's Ryan's vision. You're the provision. Own the ministry. Get in community. Conversate with people. Get them in community. And then the third chair we want to take people through is this. Committed, faith-filled believer of Jesus. We want to take a, 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 someone from a disbelief position, a place of no relationship with Jesus, conversate with them. I've had students, I've had people tell me, you know, by talking with you, I figured you'd be a lot different than you are. Yeah, I know most people say that about me. Really, I'm serious. I, I, Ubered, I Ubered here this morning, and I had a conversation with the guy about, uh, oftentimes when people ask me what I do for a living, sometimes I'm like, man, should I lie or tell the truth? Um, <laughs> Anytime I'm on an, airplane, on an airplane and someone asks me what you do for a living, if I say pastor, they're like, mm, whatever. Um, so you have a conversation with people. And you let them see that Christians aren't weirdos. We're not, we're, we're not supposed to be weirdos. You know what I mean? It's not like, hey, is that seat saved? No, but are you saved? Like, <laughs> don't be a weirdo. Conversation breaks down walls. Community softens heart. Let me say that again. Conversation breaks down walls. Community softens heart. Are you with me? Yeah. Let them run in your, your, your life group for a while. Let them see that the godly community is healthy. It's life-giving. It's not weird. And then what is beautiful is you begin to see students and leaders and adults get plugged in to the local church and become committed, faith-filled believers who are serving in the local church. You want to know the, one of the things that I think is the number one sign that somebody has made a decision to follow Jesus is when they go from renting to owning, and now they are committed. Now they are serving. Now they are a part of the ministry. And not only that, they're repeating the process. The committed believers have gone through these two chairs and they say, this is awesome. Let me do everything I can to take someone through this chair to this chair. Are you with me? So if there's any committed believers in the room today, I encourage you and challenge you to you repeat the process. How many are here because relationship? How many are here because you know somebody, someone personally invited you, took you under their wing? I am the product. I, was, I met a student named Drake. He conversed with me, helped me get in community. And for him, the community was a vehicle 
every morning before school. I would sit with him and a couple other kids, and we would converse in community. And now, because of that, committed. Who can you be taking through each one of these steps? Are you with me? So for us, I'm going to tell you a story at a, of a, one of our campus clubs called Oak Creek Middle School. And um, there was a kid named Logan. Logan was an eighth grader who started a campus club, and the campus club runs like 40 kids. It's kind of ridiculous. I'm like, I can't even, like, mo- most of the time, I can't even get eighth graders to put on deodorant. You know what I mean? Like, let alone start a campus club and it run 48 kids, and it's awesome. Anyhow, he, met, he meets this kid named Andrew. Andrew's a fellow eighth grader, doesn't know Jesus, never even been to church. They begin to have conversation. One day he says, hey, I do. I lead a campus club at, my high school, at the school. Would you come? I would love for you to come. Yeah, sure, why not? I'll come. It's at school. There's free pizza. Sure. So he comes. I think he comes for about two weeks. He enjoys it. The third week, the youth pastor named Zach Wallace comes. And he's sitting there at this club with him. Because Andrew conversed, now they're in a community. Zach met Andrew. And uh, he said, hey, I'm a pastor at a church. Would you come? I would love to have you come be a part of our church. He says, okay, yeah, sure, I'll come. And listen, he came on a Sunday morning. And not only that, um, Andrew was one of eight children. How many know that's an expensive Chipotle bill? (laughs) One of eight children. Listen, he brought all seven siblings and both parents. So ten people came from one conversation that developed into a community and and now a family of ten, a whole unit in the church doors. Now listen, that morning the pastor, (laughs) he talked about sexual morality. How many know that like, anytime you bring a guest to church, like, ah, dang it, you have to talk about that. (laughs) Um, But he talked about sexual sexual immorality and um, come to find out, Andrew's parents, they weren't married. They also weren't saved. They weren't Christians. They just came because their son took them, and I don't, they just decided, well, well, if we're going to take you, might as well take everybody else. And um, that morning, both of Andrew's parents, both of them, heard the message of the gospel, and it hit them so deeply. Both parents said, I want to know that Jesus. And they accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Wow, beautiful, right? But not just that. Listen, it gets better. Afterwards, they went up and they talked to Pastor. And they said, Pastor, your message really convicted us. Because you said, if we're not living together, or if we're not married and we're living together, we're sinning. Um, is, that, is, that, is that true? And uh, anytime, anytime someone asks a pastor that kind of a blunt question, it's kind of like, dang it. Yes. So he said, according to Scripture, yes. And so they said, what do we need to do? And Pastor said, get married. This is so good. And the dad just goes, how's Friday? (laughs) I could pencil you in. And that Friday, because of one conversation, led to a community. Andrew's whole entire family came. Parents got saved. And not only that, two parents met Jesus. And then two parents became one family. They came on a Sunday, got saved, got married on the following Friday. So let me tell you something, my friends. This strategy of evangelism, it will work. Never underestimate the power of your conversation with somebody where it could lead people. I have a church that I have a crush on. Yes, I have church crushes. And one of the things they teach about is Christians should all be fat. I'm like, that's offensive. I already, I'm almost there. But um, Christians should be fat. Faithful, available, and teachable. Faithful, available, and teachable. So let me tell you something. When you talk with people, when you have conversation with people, here's the deal. When you have a conversation with people, your end goal, track with me here, the end goal when you meet with somebody should not be, hey, I'm going to make you a convert because they can feel that and people want nothing to do with that. If, if you meet with people and you're, the premise of the conversation is, I'm not trying to change you rather than I'm just trying to love you and be your friend, be faithful, 
be available and let the Lord teach you, but what will begin to happen is that they begin to see you and who you are, God is in you. You let him do the work through it, through you. And you be available when the opportunity comes to speak the word. Are you with me right now? It's not our job to change people. It's our job to love people, to know people, and to understand people and bring them through a conversation, bring them into community, and let the Lord do a work in them and see them become committed followers of Jesus. Be faithful, be available, be teachable. I like to do everything in threes. Hallelujah. This is God's heart for the church. Would you pray?